Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode. I think this is our 12th episode, right, of uh, the Take 3 Theological Variety Hour. This week, we are going to be talking about suffering and bodiliness and all the things that revolve around those ideas. So I'm going to start out, Seth, me, Seth, is going to start out. Uh, talking about two very famous martyrs whose feast days were earlier this week, St. Sebastian and St. Agnes. Um, Then Christine is going to talk to us about the heresy of the week, which this week is uh, going to be the Marcionites. And then Erica is going to uh, lead us through a little uh, bit on suffering, the idea of suffering. So... Before we get started, though, I have a quick uh, retractione to give you, um, referencing how St. Augustine went back over his writings at the end of his life and made corrections. I listened to our podcast several times after we post it every week and found a glaring uh, misquote that I gave. Um, Not misquote, but, uh, you know, something that was wrong that I said. So in discussing Perpetua, I said that she was linked by some scholars to the Marcionites. What I meant to say was she was linked by some scholars to the Montanists, which is a totally different heresy that we'll probably talk about some other time. But anyway, all right, now that that's out of the way, uh, let's get started. So we had two uh, saints earlier this week. On the 20th, we had St. Sebastian, and on the 21st yesterday, We had St. Agnes. Both of them are early Christian martyrs. Both uh, are saints, some of the first saints that I ever kind of learned about. They're very iconographically uh, very distinct saints. Sebastian is usually depicted as a beautiful young man tied to a tree with arrows uh, sticking out of him. And Agnes is, again, kind of a beautiful youth, and she's carrying a lamb. Both saints, like I said, were martyrs. Sebastian was a Roman soldier, and he joined the military to have access to Christians and to be able to help them out during the Roman persecution of Christians. But then, unfortunately, he was found out, and um, Diocletian, again, shows up and uh, condemns That guy was such a jerk, let me just say. Yeah, what was his deal? (laughs) Um, So, uh, to kind of, you know, the golden legend isn't the, um, you know, the primary text of the universe, but I definitely go back to it a lot, especially when we're talking about saints. So I've looked at it again this week, and the story about Sebastian is, uh, again, very kind of visual, very visually interesting. So Jacobus in the Golden Legend gives this image of Sebastian being shot full of arrows because that he was condemned to death by being shot with arrows. It says that he was surrounded by arrows as a porcupine is with quills. That is definitely not often how he's depicted usually he's got like maybe one or two or three arrows in you know religious art but i guess if he had a whole bunch of arrows in him he wouldn't look quite so nice and we're going to talk about that in just a second agnes uh, again was condemned to death because of her intransigence to uh give up christianity She specifically did not want to get married and was very firm in staying a virgin. So a lot of her story kind of revolves around that idea. So she doesn't want to get married to this, you know, nobleman who is very interested in marrying her. And again, she's a young girl (laughs) when this happens. So it's a little bit weird reading the story about Agnes because she's very, like, sexualized. Part of what happens to her is since she refuses the uh, proposal of this guy, he has her sent to a brothel so that anyone who wants to can enjoy her company. It's a little bit gross and weird. Um, Not a little bit. It's a lot gross and weird. 
Um, and the story is that God miraculously made her hair grow all over her body so no one could see her. <laughs> um, so sometimes in in religious art, usually medieval religious art, you will find pictures of Agnes where she's really hairy and kind of looks like a lady sex watch because of the story. Incidentally, folks, this is one of Seth's absolute favorite, favorite saints of all time. Just to give you an idea about who Seth is. Okay, and Seth is also <laughs> the one that is insistent on wanting to do a naked episode, so... He's a weirdo. We go. That's, that's who he is. He's a um, weirdo. Now, my devotion to St. Agnes is mainly because I grew up in California, and one of our California missions, Santa Inez is here and it's very beautiful and it's in the mountains and it's full of religious art that's really cool and one of my tattoos is actually um, a painting from Santa Ines mission so I also had not heard some of these weirdo stories about her until <laughs> we, we prepared for this um, episode. So one super interesting thing about um, St. Agnes is that according to the golden legend, she was martyred under the emperor Constantine before, I guess, before he had his, you know, vision at the Milvian bridge. But unlike some of these other saint stories like Sebastian's, you know, in a lot of these stories, the martyr is actually like placed in front of the emperor and they like have a dialogue in this case, uh, pro- for, for, you know, kind of obvious reasons, probably, um, Agnes and Constantine don't, you know, dialogue with each other, but it just mentions that sh- it was, it did happen while he was emperor. So that's something I also didn't know. That's a, you know, kind of, again, a kind of a quick and dirty overview of Sebastian and Agnes. And something that I was interested in with both of them is kind of how bodiliness um, and maybe even eroticism is approached with both of these saints. So in art, Sebastian is is heavily eroticized. He's, you know, like half naked in most of the paintings of him. And Agnes uh, is definitely not half naked. She's got her, you know, her hair mantle (laughs) going on. But in my class, when I was teaching my intro class, I would usually introduce Agnes um, as kind of this image of virginity that we get in Christianity. And in preparing for those classes, I ran across a poem about St. Agnes that was written by uh, Venantius Fortunatus, who was a priest and poet during the early years of Christianity, Mm, middle I don't know, late antiquity, maybe, I'm not sure, 5th, 6th century. Anyway, he writes this poem about Agnes that uses, like, heavily sexualized imagery. Like, it's almost uncomfortable to read it because, A, you remember you're reading about basically a little girl. And he uses this, um, you know, like he talks about, the executioner thrusting his sword into her. And it's just like, it's very sexual and kind of feels like it objectifies her as a woman or a girl and also as a virgin. So it's something that I wanted to bring up today because we were talking about suffering and we are talking about, you know, the Marcionite ideas and just how sometimes maybe we sort of fetishize suffering um, and what does it really mean? So I'm really interested to hear what Erica has to say um, about suffering. But I think that in, in, in a lot of things we talk about, we, we sort of talk about how people take these views and take them to an extreme. So I think this, and it's very similar to what we talked about last week with purgatory, like taking this extreme view of suffering and like making it object to be viewed. I think we do that with the martyrs as well. Sometimes I I definitely think we do it with Agnes and Sebastian and maybe, I don't know. What do you guys think about that? I tend to agree with you. Uh, There's a lot of 
And I see this especially, there's some other young lady saints who went through some terrible times, and it really bothers me when there's a difference between, again, as we kind of made this point last week, we brought it up, I think, there's a difference between accepting the hard life that is given to you, and maybe it wasn't last week, it may have been a week before, accepting the, the harsh realities of life that sometimes happen, and just working with them as an act of faith, and going after suffering, and taking it upon yourself, and I think that too often we have these saints held up as ideals who were horribly tormented by family members. Sometimes the situation was made worse or at least not made any better by their confessors. And at no point does the church say, hey, saint so-and-so stepmother really should not have been uh, such a raging psycho, insert the B word here, they're just like, oh, she was so great. She bore up so patiently, but they never mentioned she never stood up for herself. And it, it kind of bothers me also because if you're torn, like, you know, say St. Cinderella's evil stepmother, right? By not standing up for, for herself and, and at least trying to issue some correction, it then becomes an occasion of sin for the stepmother, that the people who are doing the tormenting are never, no one ever says, hey, maybe you should stop this. All the all the stories talk about how great it was that someone bore up under this psychosis, but no one, it, it becomes an excuse right. in, in a way. You, you often hear the, the echo of the, the refrain of when something causes suffering, it, instead of saying, how can we, address that suffering and in the meantime offer it up it's just we'll offer it up Mm -hmm. you know too bad it becomes very easy for people to say offer it up and ignore the suffering of people on the other hand if people take that too much to heart like you said it becomes this whole thing of feeling like when you were talking about like the victim souls like i have to suffer i have to suffer because if i'm not suffering then God isn't happy with me. And if I don't suffer now, I'll suffer in the afterlife. Yeah, that kind of reminds me of the story that I've researched a little bit of St. Godeliev, who's a Flemish saint, um, who has a really interesting story. She's basically, was basically in a domestic violence situation. Um, She was hated by her husband and by her mother-in-law. And the story goes that she kind of accepted this suffering and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, did works of charity all all the while that she was being abused by her family. And ultimately, at the end of the story, her family kills her. So it's like, you know, and this monk that's writing her life. <laughs> what? I think. Yeah. I, just... I mean, she's what's called a... Okay. Um, uh, innocent martyr because she doesn't necessarily die for the faith but she dies kind of inexplicably like she just gets killed by her family and I think that you know making her a saint and holding her up is sort of like to make sense of what happened to her because it doesn't make sense you know it's like horrifying. I mean, it's just, it goes against like every catholic ethical principle that we have of life uh, well we're talking about the middle ages here so okay right, 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 but still still i'm i'm befuddled no and i still i mean i still think i think it's fascinating because it's like the community has this sense that wow this is really messed up but we don't really know what to do so we're gonna make her a saint you know well and you know i Far be it for me to question, you know, the saint's particular holiness and state of the afterlife. But again, I'm bothered by how did we get to a point where this woman is being abused and murdered? And does no one care about the state of the souls of those doing the abusing and the murdering? Could no one have stopped in and said, your actions, your whatever is in your heart that is causing you to do this is putting your soul in like. If nothing else, even if you're just like, yeah, you know, maybe 
great on her for putting up with the suffering, but does no one care about all the people, like the souls of the people doing this? Right. Oh, well, screw them. Or even better, yeah, yeah, look, it was great what they did because they made her into a saint. Like, it can get really twisted really quickly. Well, right, and it's like, you know, there's definitely a line between I can accept the suffering in my life and putting up with domestic abuse. <laughs> like, there's yes. a very hard line there, and I don't think that muddying up that line with hagiography is probably the best thing to do. <laughs> Where, where was where was Lucia to throw ash in their eyes? Right. I know, right. I, I feel like you know Lucia let everybody down. It's Lucia's fault. Well, we're we're gonna have to write a letter to the manager. <laughs> <That's> a strongly <laughs> worded letter. <laughs> exactly. Um. All right. Well, so I you know for us maybe and for our listeners, I just kind of want to bring those those ideas up. So maybe we can think about them more. I definitely. I've thought about them a bit and I wanted to introduce them as um, something to keep in mind. But uh, I think that's all for me today. So maybe we can go to Marcion. Okay, we're, we're going to get to Marcion in a minute. But before we transit out of the Saints, I do want to give a shout out to my man, Francis DeSales. Ooh. He's got his feast day coming up. He is a patron saint of writers. Uh, as all of you know, I am a budding writer myself, but he also wrote an excellent book called The Introduction to the Devout Life, which I would recommend for anyone. A lot of books about devotion and the prayer life were written for people who were under vows, who were active religious. This book is different. This was written to a noble woman who was also a, who, who was a mother and ran a business, but she wanted to have a closer connection with God. She wanted to have a more devout life. So he approaches, he he writes these series of letters um, guiding her in this and taking into account having to balance the work of a mother and having to balance the work of running the, the you know these estates and this business. And I, I think anyone today, yeah, you're going to have to do some uh, adjustment because unlike this uh, no, this woman, you probably don't have your own chapel and your own priest available to you so that you can go to mass every morning uh, like yeah, he man. recommends. I know, right? Oh, if only I could win the lotto. Um, but other than that, his, his advice about balancing the prayer life with the worldly matters that you are duty bound to attend to, it becomes this really down to earth guide. And so I would recommend it for any of our listeners and would say that if you want to pursue a relationship with God uh, and a deeper relationship with God, it is absolutely should be on the bookshelf of books that help inspire and guide you. So we can talk more about him at some other point, but I just wanted to throw that out there before I get onto the Marcionites. So this week's heresy of the week is Marcionism. And I think you guys are going to, all of our listeners will recognize a lot of these ideas. Marcionism is it's a heresy that I don't agree with, but I have a lot of sympathy for and a lot of understanding for. So Marcion of Sinope was a guy who lived in Rome around 144 AD. He, he was a very prosperous businessman. I think he owned um, like a shipbuilding company. So he had some cash. He was a, a Christian but he had some issues with the Old Testament. In fact, he had so many issues with the Old Testament. He entirely rejected uh, the Hebrew Bible. He rejected the deity described in the Old Testament. In that way, he's like a lot of the, the Gnostic sects, uh, where they had this idea that the God of the Old Testament was sort of the Demiurge, who was a, a lesser deity who was either bumbling or malevolent. Marcion had a very similar idea that the God of the Old Testament was a lesser God than the all forgiving God of the New Testament. And we don't actually have any of Marcion's own writings left. Most of what we have is written by his critics, including um, there was a five book treatise written by our guy Tertullian. He wrote the, the Adversus Marcionem around 208 A.D., in which, you know, five books, uh, he goes, I guess he goes into some detail. And that's how we know what we know. 
about Marcion. So he, Marcion put together his own canon of scripture, and it only had 11 books. There was one gospel, the Gospel of Christ, which is basically 10 sections that also appear in the Gospel of Luke, and then the 10 Pauline epistles. He gets rid of the entire, he's a, first of all, he's credited as, as being the first guy to separate Old Testament from New Testament. He gets rid of the entire Old Testament. He gets rid of all the Gospels except for those 10 sections from the Gospel of Luke. He gets rid of all the other epistles except for the 10 from Paul. Everything else, he just says, nope, not part of it. Because in, in his view, they were too heavily influenced by the Judaic thought in the Old Testament. And he he didn't believe that while while Christ, he did believe that Christ was sent by God. He considered the God that Christ was sent from as being a higher and different God than the God of the Old Testament. So all of the Old Testament prophecies, all of that, he kicks right out the door. And it is interestingly, it is speculated by a uh, theologian whose name is Robert Price. Yeah, Robert <laughs> Price, but no relation. Maybe maybe a distant cousin to your uh, respected husband, Erica. But oh. I, I, I started snickering. Um, wow, Rob Bratton, theology on the down low. Uh, yeah, but if he, so when they were trying to figure out who first collected the Pauline epistles that ended up in our standard uh, New Testament canon, people weren't sure if the earliest of the early church fathers had access to them. And the first time that they can really see these having been collected and put together is from Marcion. So here's Marcion with this idea. He, he ends up being condemned as a heretic, but he also becomes foundational in our putting together the New Testament. A lot, uh, apparently there's a lot of old uh, Latin versions of the Bible that have the introduction to the Pauline epistles is credited originally to Marcion himself. Later versions don't have that, but it's really interesting that, yeah, this guy was a heretic and, and he kicked out a lot of what we consider to make up the Bible, but he was also instrumental in helping put together the Bible that we have. That's so, crazy. I didn't know that. So formally, his heresy existed for about 300 years before it formally died out. But I am certain that everyone has encountered this idea before. This is an idea that is perennial because anyone who actually reads the Bible starts to get a little troubled, at least by the book of Judges, if they weren't troubled already. I'll be honest, I couldn't get through the entire book of Judges. And it is it is work to reconcile what happens and what God is credited as having commanded and said all throughout the Old Testament, contra to what we learn about God in the New Testament. It's something a lot of people got to work with. I think that it can be reconciled. It can be difficult. And there's a lot of theories as to what things that were not in, recorded in scripture that might have actually given better understanding. Um, you know, the more you learn about the Canaanites and their practices, the more you realize that, yeah, those were, wow, maybe it made sense that all of them had that, you know, God actually did ordain a genocide on them because they were just so vile and wicked and so corrupt with evil that it had to happen. Maybe uh, that's that's something everyone ultimately has to work out for themselves and, and find out for themselves. But you'll see modern day atheists, modern day agnostics. I mean, even today, I saw across Twitter, apparently the quarterback for the Green Bay Packers, Aaron Rodgers, has rejected, has announced that he's rejecting Christianity because he doesn't believe that a benevolent and loving God would condemn most of his creation to hell. And those are, that's a paraphrase of what he was saying. Even today, people are having a hard time reconciling what seems to be opposing extremes. And maybe at some point uh, later on, we can uh, discuss together how do you reconcile the things that seem to be contradictory in scripture. But it is a problem that has existed from clearly the beginning. It is a problem that persists. And that's why I have a lot of sympathy and understanding for it. 
I would recommend if if this idea and and how it was dealt with interests you, go ahead and look up Marcionism in Wikipedia or in Folk Galactic. See if you can find a copy of any of the arguments written against him. I don't know if the Adversus Marcionum was ever translated into English. And if it was, it's probably prohibitively expensive. That just being my experience with trying to find English translations of early church fathers' texts. You can so, usually get them for free on the new Advent site, though. Mm. I mean, it's usually kind of a cruddy translation, but if you want to, like, look at it at all, it's usually... It, a- it's a, yeah, they didn't have Jerome's um, commentary on the Ephesians, which is what I was, you know, that, that's my experience with things costing an arm and a leg to get. Uh, but yeah, yeah he, they, they're my, yeah, they, against, they might have it. Yeah, Against Martian is on... Um, New Advent, but you can also check Classics Ethereal, li- Christian Classics <laughs> Ethereal Library, um, okay. and we can put that link up, but they have a, a huge wealth of information on there um, that in translation and in um, the original text, so that's another place that you could look that's completely free. Okay, so that's, that's what I had to say on Marcionism. Again, really interesting to look at how early this happened and how it's still sort of it's out there it's a hard thing to deal with i think you're definitely right about you know people need to reconcile that for themselves um i would just add that it's super important i think to look at really good biblical and historical biblical uh scholarship when you're trying to work those things out because some of those stories from the old testament aren't meant to be taken literally they weren't meant to be taken literally by the people who wrote them so it's like that's that's a a a really important you know kind of of it not to just kind of go off on you know a tangent somewhere (laughs) yeah exactly like really do get some solid research and also always keep in mind and I, i this is one of my favorite passages from paul to remember that right now we see through a glass darkly and also remember God's ways are not our ways. There will always be things that, that he wants that we do not understand. Uh, so I think but between the solid uh, scholarship and research and realizing your own limitations, uh, that can take you a long way toward that reconciliation. Erica. All right. So, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about suffering and we've talked about suffering before. And so some of what I'm saying is going to be a a little bit of a repeat, but I think it, it bears repeating actually. And at first I had thought about all of these, these texts that I was going to use because I have studied suffering quite a bit. We will talk more about one of uh, Seth and my beloved professors who meant the world to us, Father Stephen Duffy, later. But I took a Mystery of Suffering class with him. And so this was kind of an undergrad, the beginning of talking about thinking about suffering. And at the time, I really needed to take the class because I had a lot of doubts and a lot of questions myself about why people suffered and what was happening. One of the things that uh, Father Duffy taught us most in Mystery of Suffering is that suffering was not something just to be tossed away. It wasn't something to um, just think of as coming from an evil God. And this is coming off of our talk of, of Christine's Heresy of the Week, Marcionism. And I think it's important to, to for me to say that if we're talking about suffering as the result of a God um, who is evil, then there is no purpose. And then I, I, I I lose a purpose. Sometimes listeners, (laughs) life throws unexpected things at you. I'm going to be completely honest with you. I've had to stop this recording and conversation about three times now because my three-year-old wants his mother's attention, which for those of you who have three-year-olds is quite normal for a three-year-old to want, um, thus suffering. 
on a minor scale, but nevertheless, we're talking about suffering, and that is suffering. So I apologize for uh, any inconveniences and, and odd transitions that you may hear uh, due to my son. But, so moving on, um, I think it's important to, to take a broader picture and to see how deep uh, this issue of suffering is. And, and it is. It is um, about as widespread as uh, people across the globe because every single person, every single person, no matter how great you think your neighbor has it, uh, every person on this globe in, experiences suffering throughout their lives. And as a result, and one of the things that I, I studied with Father Duffy, I was saying that um, you know it was a very purposeful class at a particular time for me. And as a result, I think there is a lot of literature about suffering. So going back to uh, just to Marcionism for a minute, is the God of the Old Testament evil? Um, no, I don't think so. I think God, as Christine said, rightfully can be wrathful. I think God can bestow judgment. But when we talk about evil, we're talking about something that is really particular to humanity. We can't even really posit evil upon creatures, because in order to be evil, you have to be rational and you have to have a rational mind and a rational soul. You have to have a will. Um, these are all early philosophical uh, ideas, Aristotelian and uh, Platonic from Aristotle and Plato, which we can definitely go into another time. But in order for evil to exist, humanity has to exist. And so evil really becomes um, a part and, and part and partial of humanity. So thus we have suffering. So looking at a couple, um, just a couple pieces of literature that came to my mind when we when I started thinking about suffering, and a lot of them from the class with Father Duffy, Camus' um, The Plague, which is set in Africa and I would really, it's not a long book, but I would really recommend reading it because it's very important from an existential point. Why does humanity exist? It's important from a point of absurdity. Um, all of these terrible things that are happening, why do they happen? But it's also extremely important from a place of suffering because each character in the book has a particular type of suffering and has a very hard time suffering. And... What do the characters do about it? What do they learn and how do their lives go on? And, and we'll get to that. Another book that comes to mind is William Golding's Lord of the Flies. Uh, you have a group of boys who are stuck, uh, stranded after a plane crash. And they go through acting out and becoming uh, the adult counterparts, basically, of, of what's happening in their lives. And there is a prophetic uh, little boy named Simon and Simon really becomes um, not just the savior, but the person who talks about the suffering of one of the other members, uh, Piggy. And so what is, what's the purpose of suffering in that? Uh, and ultimately, is suffering purposeful at all? It's a tough question. Uh, as I've said before in previous podcasts, I had a professor in particular whom I will not call out, uh, tell me that suffering was absolutely not purposeful whatsoever. And I can partially see what she was saying. Is suffering in itself purposeful? Maybe not. But what I can say is that the result of suffering and what becomes out of the experience of suffering can be extremely purposeful. And we see that in literature. If you look at the quips of literature and how literature progresses when we're talking about suffering, you have the problem of suffering, you identify uh, with w at least one of the people who is experiencing suffering, and then you see people come together in a good way on behalf of the suffering, uh, to alleviate the suffering of other people. And really, perhaps throughout history, when we've come together best is when we've been able to identify with each other through this mass or mutual suffering. So these are all really important points when we're talking about suffering. And 
Um, does anybody want to suffer? Well, no, obviously not. But is there a point to it in the, the broader scheme of things? Um, I do believe that there is. Uh, part of the reason that I didn't prepare more for today, um, other than the fact that I found just way too much that I wanted to pack into this one little, little talk, uh, was because I was actually baking cookies. And I know, oh gosh, Eric is baking cookies instead of doing her work for the podcast. Um, well, part of the reason I was baking cookies is because I recently found out, my husband is a high school teacher, and I found out that um, 6%, roughly 6% of the student body is homeless. And these high schoolers are coming to school without somebody to feed them in the morning. They're coming to school hungry. They have to do their work hungry. And it was just, I guess, our way. They had started a new term, so he had all new students, of having them come into a classroom and saying, giving them some recognition in in their suffering because they are in the midst of suffering daily and saying, hey, you know, we know you're here. Um, and so it was a reflection on my part, on my husband's part of recognizing their suffering and taking action to do something about it, even if it's just a stupid chocolate chip cookie. But their reaction told him that it was needed and that they really appreciated being seen um, because some of their parents do not see them and some of the city and the community does not see them. So important actions come on, on behalf and because of our suffering. I certainly would not have ever, ever gotten into Christianity, theology, and definitely not ethics if I had not had my own particular path of hardship as a, a child and a teenager, and it really shaped who I became and who I'm, who I'm still becoming. So finally, um, that's all I'm going to say to you for now. It's, it's going to be less, uh, less heady and less bookish than next week. We'll get to next week, but I'm super, super excited about that. Um, and finally, uh, I just want to leave you with a quote. So, I was 17 years old. This is, this is going to be a funny story. Kind of funny. Somebody's going to laugh. I was 17 years old and I was at a meet the majors um, event. And there was this dashing young man that was standing in the classroom. Oh God. <laughs> and we both moved to a wall because somebody, uh, another major was eating this horrid, smelling tuna fish that neither of us could stand so we kind of huddled together uh and it was really really bad <laughs> but um we ended up finding each other and one of the things that this person who will remain unknown um brought into my life was the story of uh the bridge of san luis rey and I never heard of it before, before he brought it to me. And it really had, he doesn't know it probably, but it really had an incredible impact on my life to see these characters and how they develop and how God so intricately played an unknown part to each of them in the story. Uh, and he can talk about it much, much better than I can. But um, I'm going to leave you with a quote. And it's a, an incredibly meaningful quote to me that's kind of stayed with me. So... Uh, again, Thornton Wilder's uh, Bridge of San Luis Rey. Some say that we shall never know and that to the gods we are like the flies that the boys kill on a summer's day. And some say to the contrary that the very sparrows do not lose a feather that has not been brushed away by the finger of God. And so no matter what that is actually supposed to mean, what it means to me is the importance of believing in purpose and in actions and that God does not sleep. When suffering happens to us, it doesn't mean God caused it. It doesn't mean that God is evil. It does mean that like we see each other in suffering, God sees us and, and God recognizes the suffering that we're going through. Um, it's it, part of human will, part of, uh, of our freedom to choose what we will choose. Um, and, and that was what God wanted for us. And the, the down part, downside of that is that we have to put up with suffering and evil. But God doesn't sleep, and God does see us in our moments of suffering and is perhaps the most empathetic um, 
and, and closest to us when we are suffering. So just a few thoughts to take with you uh, as you go about your week. And next week, and next week, we're going to do Thomas Aquinas, and I'm so excited. Oh, my gosh. I am like Thomas Aquinas fangirl. So each of us are going to take a part of Aquinas, and um, I think we're all excited about it. Aren't we all excited about yeah. it? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yes. I have Thomas such a rant Aquinas. built up, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> part of the importance of Aquinas is that so much of Catholic theology is dependent upon Aquinas. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested to, um, to hear what we all have to say. Okay. Me too. Awesome. So that is, yeah, that's our, that's our episode. See you guys next week then for Aquinas week. Bye.